Right. Well, let's let's move ahead and, and keep the momentum going from what we heard uh, from Adair Turner. Uh, we need to talk about how to invest in it. Is money coming in? Why is it not coming in if it's not? Uh, there's an enormous amount of money around to invest in green and sustainability. Um, it's revolutionising already the world of investment, but how far is it really revolutionising it? How much is there talk about it? How much is there commitment? And a commitment which is not designed just to give the impression of satisfying the, the pressures for greater sustainability and ESG. So where is the current money, the smart money going at the moment? Where is um, the ESG excitement sustainable? And what assets run the risk of becoming stranded? So let me um, take you back. I'm going to make a few remarks um, to contextualize uh, my intervention. Um, to, and to start off, uh, I would like to take you to the last economic crisis in 2008-2009, the Great Recession. Um, as we know, the, the impact of that financial crisis was quite severe in, in developing countries. Um, they, they, they were impacted because of reduced foreign investments, trade, reduced trade, remittances. And this, of course, uh, you know, the world, the world's poorest countries uh, suffered particularly. Um, in Africa, for example, uh, we observed the 20% uh, GDP per, cap per capita income uh, decrease uh, for the poorest 400 million people. This is very significant for poor communities. And uh, one can ask, what was the response back then? There was stimulus provided as well, but only around 16% of that stimulus went towards green initiatives. And what we saw as well, like much like we are seeing right now with this COVID uh, pandemic crisis, uh, is that there was initially a decrease in uh, global emissions because of the economic downturn, but that picked up quite quickly. Uh, there was a significant rebound, um, several fold rebound in, in global emissions uh, in 2010. At that time as well, um, here we are talking about 2008, 2009, um, and when we talk about energy, uh, the energy sector, renewable energy accounted for around 8% of the energy sources. Uh, and 90 percent of this 8 percent was coming from hydropower. At that time, uh, and this now links to our work, the G8 decided that they were going to be putting in place a funding mechanism with a significant amount of capital to spearhead investments, climate relevant investments in developing countries. And that was when the climate investment funds were established. And as you said, Nick, we are now an $8.5 billion fund. We are now investing in more than 72 developing countries. We have a portfolio of more than 300 uh, projects. Um, and what we have done was first of its kind, sometimes second, third of its kind investments um, until they can be fully, um, in, uh, fully financed by uh, the, the private markets commercially. We have also worked with the financial institutions to create domestic debt markets that didn't exist. And we have been providing guarantees to, for example, domestic bond market issuances. And the, the impact has been quite um, visible and important. We have supported uh, the, the installation of 26 gigawatts of clean power in developing countries. And again, as I said, many of these, the first of its kind renewable energy uh, investments, we have, we are supporting 10 million people uh, having improved energy access, uh, 6 million jobs and $46 billion in indirect and direct and indirect economic value added in, in these economies and these communities. And with our capital, because our capital is public capital, is risk concessional patient capital, uh, we were able to unlock 60 billion, more than $60 billion more of investment. So that's the total investment envelope, uh, one third of which from private sector. So um, I, I'm, I, I, I think it's important to reflect in, on that financial crisis um, and also reflect on our experience as we were created 
um, when that financial crisis was happening and was impacted, and in a context where it was even more difficult to foresee climate investments happening uh, in these countries and capital was flowing away from developing countries. Now we are um, 2020, 2021, we have a, a much deeper um, crisis. And in fact, you know, the IMF has said that the, this, the global output because of this crisis declined three times more than in 2007, 2008, 2009, and in half of the time. And in fact, uh, the, the growth in low-income economies this year is anticipated to be the slowest in the past 20 years rather than last year. What, what, what does this mean? That we are basically erasing three to four years of progress in poverty reduction in developing countries. And by the end of this year, we can see about 100 million people uh, falling back into uh, extreme poverty. This is quite sobering. And when we look at the fiscal measures that are being, and the response measures and the stimulus packages, they are quite significant. Uh, there's more than $16 trillion being uh, invested in, in, um, in the context of this crisis. But unfortunately, most of these are not focused on recovery spending as a long-term impact. Um, the United Nations Environment Program actually estimated that from across the 50 largest countries in 2020, 13% of overall spending was directed towards long-term recovery. And, and out of this 13, only 18% was focused on green recovery initiatives. So one key message for me to begin with is that based on our experience, now even more than in 2008 or 9, we need the G7, we need the G8, the G20. G20 is responsible for 80% of the emissions. We need these countries and the private sector leaders to really step up uh, and take the necessary measures uh, and decisions that will lead to similar outcomes of what we have been able to achieve over the last 12 years, but at a much, much larger uh, scale. And in fact, the UN Secretary General just came out. Um, there was a, a press statement released showing that from the NDCs that have been submitted to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, um, we are way above the 1.5 scenario. Uh, and therefore, really urging G20 countries in particular to really step up uh, their ambition level. I'm focusing quite a bit in developing countries because um, we should also bear in mind that developing economies uh, are on track to run on 70% of the world's energy supply. And they represent 60% of the global GDP. Not only that, but uh, these countries, non-OECD countries, they really represent the fastest growing markets in the world. There are estimates indicating investment needs of 90 trillion by 2030 in the areas of energy, transport, urban water and other infrastructure. And two thirds of these investments will be made in developing countries. And so that's also why I, I normally say that the climate crisis will be resolved uh, in developing countries. And that's also where countries are facing the highest, the most severe impacts, both from the climate and the COVID pandemic. Um, and so a focus on, on these countries from all of these perspectives is, is quite uh, critical. And we hear often there's no lack of capital. Um, there's a lot of capital, of course. Uh, we know that, the, the, for example, the international institutional investors, they hold around $115 trillion in assets. They have uh, all of this capital under management. And we also know that there are several trillion uh, in negative yielding assets. So finding a way of even having a fraction of this um, alongside targeted public money like ours uh, could really be uh, game-changing and, and have a very significant um, impact. 
You've touched on ESG, uh, Nick, and I know this is one of the themes that the panel will be discussing. Um, and that's one way that investors are allocating their capital. Um, one of the issues that I would like to bring to this uh, event here today is the fact that we should note that there are very perverse incentives that lead to the reallocation away uh, from the poor countries to the wealthier countries of these uh, ESG investments. So I know that we are seeing significant volumes uh, of investment um, aligned with ESG. And so therefore the question, is all of this excitement uh, sustainable? And there are issues around greenwashing and what what are we considering ESG and, and should it be considered ESG? But uh, there's this other dimension that uh, really needs to be discussed and people be mindful of and, and, and be tackled uh, which is the, these prevents incentives that actually move capital away from, from uh, poor countries. Because these sovereign ESG scores um, that were really designed to measure the country's sustainability are 90% explained by the country's level of development. Um, and so this is why we, we end up uh, with the outcome uh, that I was just uh, alluding to. I think what we need to see right now is bold leadership, but bold leadership not just in making big statements and bold statements in events and and paper and but but really bold leadership in terms of commitments and action um, and in particular in support of developing countries who are really right now severely severely impacted even more than in two thousand eight or nine with the current crisis. Uh, but also where the, the largest opportunities uh, lie to, to attain both you know, Paris Agreement goals, but also the, the SDGs as well. Thank you, Mafalda. Um, we're going to pick up some of those points a little later, but let me go immediately because uh, we've got a lot of voices here to Martin Frankel, who's vice chair of S&P Global uh, from the UK, Martin, particularly if you can pick up on that one point that um, Mafalda made, that actually there's an awful lot of cash out there. It needs to be committed in a, in a far more decisive way um, to back what uh, her fund is doing. So I think there is a lot of cash out there, and I, I think some of the points that Dare made are, are, are super positive and optimistic, um, because I rather agree with him that um, technological solutions are now uh, much more evident than they were um, when we were looking at these um, topics 10 or even 15 years ago. And globally, um, industry has been at this now for, for quite a while. Um, the problem is that the, the cash being allocated and developing it, uh, projects is, uh, is not solving the problem yet um, and is a long, long way away from solving the project, uh, a long way away from solving the problem. Um, and I think we have to be realistic about that. And the reason is that the demand for energy, broadly speaking, around the world uh, continues to, to go up. Um, and it goes up, um, and I think the, the previous speaker alluded to this, to this uh, particularly because in, in the uh, non-G20 um, um, parts of the world, um, the, um, the economies are still underdeveloped as something like... Uh, 20-25% of people in China have um, uh, an income of less than $5 a day. And the provision of energy is absolutely critical to these people. So, um, and similarly in India and elsewhere. So the, the capital can get allocated. The projects, it's extremely positive, as Adair pointed out, that the, the possibility to um, allocate capital and have profitable projects is much, much higher. Um, than it was in the past. Um, the problem is that the, the projects don't, and companies like BP are struggling with this at the moment with their new um, strategy. The projects, um, the renewables projects, don't produce the types of returns that the traditional fossil fuel projects produce. And the demand for the fossil fuels continues to be there, and it continues to be there in a very significant way um, because it's actually demand um, which leads um, have here um, rather than supply. The supply meets the demand. If the demand's not there, the prices would be, would be lower and the returns to fossil fuel projects would be lower. 
But the fact is that demand is there and the returns are much higher on the fossil fuel projects. Let's, let's, let's be very frank about this. How many in, in, in the business that you, which you are representing along with your colleagues here, how much is there a willingness to talk about support but not really commit with the cash? Now, whether you want to call it greenwashing is, is, is beside the point. In other words, there's a degree of putting a face on it as opposed to real commitment which, can, which, will, which will move things in a significant direction, in, in, in the direction that Mafalda is talking about. I mean, I, I'm, I'm definitely a, a Bill guy rather than a, a, a Greta person because is I it the same that, question? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, let, let me come to that in a minute. And, and I think I'm a, I'm a Bill guy because, um, you know, it's it's all got to be practical. And, and I think as Gates in his book, which is a very good book by the way, um, that this interaction between um, public policy. Um, private sector responses and technology is really critical. We're not going to have um, the behavioural change. I mean, I could give you any number of, of, of pieces of data points to demonstrate to you that the behavioural changes are just not there at the moment. We can, and that's not a that's not a value judgment. That's that's just a statement of of, of fact, right? I mean, we had this unfortunate. Um, unfortunate uh, trial, if you like, in the last couple of years brought on by COVID as to what behavioural change would look like and where we all stayed at home and where we all had to change our lifestyle. And as soon as people could, in whatever part of the world they were in, they chose to come back to their previous lifestyles. So gasoline demand, for example, in India this year is back to 2019 levels. And India is still, as you know, in, in the pandemic. And, and those sorts of statistics are the same all over the world. So I think that the hydrocarbon sector absolutely understands now and absolutely understands that A, it's incentivated, and B, that it needs to have a social contract to produce, and that it must do something itself um, to uh, deploy capital to reduce its carbon footprint. Um, but that's not in itself going to be enough. Um, public policy and the technology change around that must come with it. All right, let's go to uh, Ewan Murray. Ewan, I hope you're still there, Head of Investments uh, at Hermes. Uh, you heard them, uh, Martin, say behavioural changes are not there at the moment. What view are you taking about how to invest money and whether it's coming in? I think I'm going to take an ecosystem view and suggest that we need a combination of both what Mafalda was talking about as, as, well, as, uh, as well as some of what um, Martin was mentioning. If we take the existing fossil fuel sector, we know that the figures used to calculate the levelized cost of electricity by policymakers, regulators, utilities, and the corporations themselves are massively uh, overstating the cost of electricity. And that's all because they use a capacity factor, or utilization rate if you prefer, that is does not decay over the life of their assets. So if you look at UK coal's capacity factor, in fact, that fell from around 58% in 2013 down to maybe 8% in 2019. What does that all mean? It means that fossil fuels definitely need to stay in the ground. Uh, well, that's interesting. Uh, hopefully, that would then release uh, a whole load of capital for investment in renewables. Now, does that make any sense from a broader view? I think it does. I think that means uh, millions of new jobs would need to shift. There'd be a, a whole load of reskilling to be done to accommodate that investment in renewables. Uh, I think there are significant health and climate benefits to the order of trillions, I suspect, if you counted them all up by 2050, uh, that would accrue from that uh, investment in renewables. But the big question for me is, where does that investment in renewables come from? Can it be done with some of the existing oil and gas majors? And I guess my case is, if we engage with some of those firms, we can do it uh, both that way, as well as investing in newer companies. Why do I say that? I think that the European oil majors in particular uh, have the capacity if they reduce their production, both upstream and downstream, by around 30%, 40% mark, re freeing up uh, billions of capex, reinvesting that in renewables, we could make it with the existing uh, corporates. Now, equally, I'd be the first to admit, I think that there are other oil and gas majors out there who are simply culturally not capable of transitioning. 
but this all it, it's not going to be easy and i don't want anybody to get the impression that i think it is it's going to re require a huge effort and a huge amount of engagement on behalf of firms like us firms that will if i'm brutally honest uh, actually take their stewardship responsibilities seriously um, knowing that if we don't own some of these oil and gas majors and get them to change we sell them to somebody else or they'll be taken private or the assets will be nationalized then we will never achieve the transition that we're after you sell if you sell you and of course that means someone thinks that there's value in buying it so all you've done is shifted the onus of responsibility do you think there's a market for this i do fear that that is exactly what's going on today that some folks who would follow a divestment policy uh, are simply shifting the burden to somebody else to take care of a problem that actually we as proper institutional investors who engage with these companies to get them to change we should be carrying that burden and responsibility burden of responsibility martin i i know we need to listen to to joel and also to fonclay in a moment but do you want to just come in quickly on this about yeah. burden of responsibility well one one quick comment which is i i don't think it's just about getting the companies to change the companies own production assets. Um, companies can divest of production assets, but if there's value in those assets, somebody will buy them, and people are buying them. If you look at the evolution of, for example, the North Sea assets in the UK, um, they're pretty much all divested by now by, um, by, the, um, by the oil and gas um, majors, and they're owned by private equity-backed firms um, and Chinese firms, which continue to produce those assets as they, de uh, as they wind down. And the reason that they produce those assets is because they produce a return, and there's demand for the oil and gas. And the reason that there's demand for the oil and gas is because um, the demand and the processes around it exist around the world. So I think we need to be c careful about not producing perverse outcomes. Um, so if you, just to give one example, um, oil produced in the North Sea happens to be um, relatively low in its carbon footprint um, relative to other productions of some other productions of oil around the world, for example, um, in, in Mexico or ca uh, Canadian oil sands. So which one do we want to end up being produced as demand for oil um, winds down, which, by the way, at the moment it's not. It's increasing. Um, but as uh, being optimistic and hoping that demand for oil does wind down over the next decade or two, which productions of oil do we want to be produced? We want the ones to be produced which have got the lowest carbon footprint. Um, so I think that um, one has to feel about producing um, unexpected and perverse outcomes. Joel, let Joel Rue, who is chairman of uh, the Bridge Tank, Welcome. Uh, what do you want to pick up on from what you've heard and the big points you want to make? Thank you, Nick. A straight connection to what Martin just said. I'm happy, Martin, you reintroduced the concept of assets because finance is not just money. It's assets into which you gear the money. And I feel like uh, Adair Turner very optimistic for the long term. And it's good news to hear that for the first time on the long term, we're not dead, but we're saved. But the transition also has a transitory for finance. And I think that in the coming future, we don't have assets in the sense that we don't have classes of, classes of assets which are stabilized enough. To stabilize classes of assets, you need risks and you need a time frame. On the risks, Risks are numerous, like the profitability of project, the capacity to scale it up, the regulatory risk, the dispersion, diversity across different markets in the world. Even if you don't think about going global when you have a fund, even if you focus only on the EU, let's say, within the EU you have a time frame of meso macroeconomic adding of renewable capacity that varies capacity, sorry, in energy that varies extremely from one country to another. So your own plans will have a return which in fact depends on multiple hypotheses on other plans. It's exactly what we see in the market prices in Europe these days within the current system. You get remunerated not on the virtue of what you, the electricity you produce, but on the uh, bundling uh, and on the last uh, pilotable uh, capacity which you add into the market. So you have no visibility on risk. You have no visibility on the time frame uh, because, as I said, we don't know whether there will be accelerators, tipping points, and, and etc. You don't have classes of assets. 
worse. I'm not sure we have mega trends because the mega trends have also somehow to be seen at a certain time horizon. I agree, in 50 years from now, 40 years from now, maybe even 30 years from now, green hydrogen and the, 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 the way it was described by uh, Adair Turner had had a very strong techno push uh, since the Hydrogen Council got created, uh, got launched in Davos in 2017. We were the only think tank invited at the launch. We couldn't think at that time that uh, packages would move from tens of millions into tunes of billions. But for, for all other technologies, uh, we don't know whether there will be a techno push, we don't know whether there will be industrial alliances, we don't know whether the govern governments will push. And even within the, those industries in which you have the techno push, again back to hydrogen, you don't have a single or some varieties of ecosystems. Take any country, and we've done this exercise, take any country in the world, you have a different blending of the hydrogen ecosystems. Now back to finance, which needs at the end of the day simple things. Remember, an investment model has to be simple because sometimes it will be run by someone who has simple views. We are very far from that. So the transitory in terms of putting this money that exists into those problem, into those solutions which we could foresee, I think is extremely uh, difficult. One last point is that, as I said, no classes of assets, fine. No mega trends, fine. Worse, it's chaotic. I already explained that in the sense of if you look at energy uh, and the kind of different renewable energies that are piled up into different countries, even, in con even in, within a country within a zone which uh, some homogeneity like the EU. Imagine now the problem when you have uh, the energy part of the techno-agrarian paradigm of uh, their Turner, the energy part that combines with the agriculture part. We can see very well that agriculture can capture CO2, that Agriculture as an energy content. Now, when you imagine uh, the, the unknown, the uncertainties, when those two sectors will combine, I think it takes courage for investors to invest into that. At the end of the day, it will work for investors, but it needs courage. It needs a bit of gamble, maybe of spreading and hedging. I think hedging is very important. And it needs pretty stable investors uh, reinvestors into, into your funds. Just before I go to Franklin, I'm fascinated. I've been sitting here for the last four minutes since you said it. Not sure we have mega trends yet. Now, maybe I'm misunderstanding you, but I need to clarify it on behalf of everyone listening. Uh, because, and put me right if I'm wrong. We have a very, very clear direction of travel mm -hmm. and an expectation of where we need to get to. Mm -hmm. We've just heard Mafalda say, the UN Secretary General has said, we're almost, we stand almost no chance of meeting 1.5 degrees. The mega trend there should be to try and do everything possible for that to be achieved. But if I'm, re if I'm hearing you right, a mega ambition is not the same as a mega trend. Very quickly, no, exactly. Because an ambition has components. If we would have a single energy that would crack a single problem, we're in a commodity world. We're not. So take very quickly energies across the board. Coal, well, I wouldn't invest in coal. Here we have a mega trend. The speed in which you disinvest, uh, you know, you have to ask the Chinese, you have to ask India, etc. But we, we, and the Polish, uh, but we will have to, to disinvest. That's the only clear thing. Mm -hmm. Gas is seen, is increasingly seen as an energy that will remain within the transition. Oil as well. Oil Definitely for some, I would say, uh, chemical transformations. We will still need oil in the chemical uh, transformations. And there will kind of always be leakages in the process. But also in some, uh, in some other uses, oil will remain for some time. Now, for how long, we don't know. Now, the other energies, uh, hydrogen, you have a variety of hydrogens. You can also have hydrogen produced by nuclear. Nuclear is highly... Is nuclear part of the solution in some countries possibly, in some other countries maybe not? Will we have a light, mobile, uh, you know, small uh, pilotable unit 
uh, of nuclear, 20 megawatts, the American way. Uh, Americans are thinking in terms of that. The Chinese are thinking in terms of that. Are we having mega uh, power plants the French way? Are we having next generation technologies the way the Chinese want to go about it? Anyway, whether nuclear is within the mega trends or not, we don't know. So when you have so many uncertainties and when, when you have maybe too many mega trends, you don't have a mega trend. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think it's a very interesting conversation. Uh, for me, the only trend that really is important is that um, nothing is working. Nothing. Uh, nothing is working. Not nothing. Because you come from Mars, and people tell you, we're doing everything to reduce CO2 in the atmosphere. And I look at the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, and it's breaking record after record for the last 20 years. Nothing is working. You can talk about assets. You can tell me about anything. But it's not working. So if it was cancer, you're my doctor, and my tumor is growing, and you're giving me aspirin. I'm like, what are you doing? Nothing is working. Nothing is working. So I think we have to come back to you know, real numbers. You look at the CO2 in the atmosphere, and we broke record during the pandemic while we were reducing um, emissions. We broke record again uh, last April. If we are serious, you know, Germany spent $800 billion in the last 10 years to decarbonize their atmosphere. And the only thing they can do is to compromise with the Russians to get gas. If you look at the trend of the last 10 years, you know, renewable basically grew. Everybody's so happy about renewable grew. But gas grew twice as much, and that's why every oil and gas producer says we are going to go into renewable because they are selling gas when they sell a, uh, you know, solar panel or they sell a, a wind turbine. This is ridiculous. When we are told about government should do more action, government cannot do more action. We saw it in France. We raised the gas price five cents. Everybody was in the streets. There is nothing, nothing governments can do. Because the clear technology is it's not working. Because you know, solar and wind, if you're an engineer, you understand the energy density of solar and wind is way below fossil fuel. So it's going to be more expensive. It is more expensive. It doesn't work. Governments cannot do anything. We're in a real bind. And so the only way to come out of that bind is to invent something new. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Governments didn't do international commerce. It's the guy who invented the container who made international commerce. We need a guy who is going to invent the container to move forward. Everything you heard, and the guy before who is fantastic, he speaks so well, but he's completely off. It's unbelievable. Are you talking about Adair Turner? Yeah, a wonderful guy. Super nice accent. I, better than mine, but it's completely off when you look at Why is he off? Why, 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 why because is... I am on the forefront of trying to build a nuclear technology that is the next generation. I am trying. I'm completely naive about nuclear. I stumbled upon it, and like the Good Samaritan in the Bible, I picked it up, and I said, oh, what can I do with you? You know, you're almost dead, you know? And so I tried to pick him up. I put him in the hospital. I said, you're doing better. And hopefully he's doing better. And I have car industry calling me and saying, how are we going to produce green hydrogen? Because I don't know how. They realize now that they're not going to produce green hydrogen with renewables. It's crazy, you know, because an electrolyzer is super expensive. And wind works only part time. And if you're going to think that you're going to use only the surplus wind, to produce hydrogen, then the capex of your electrolyzer is uh, pff, through the roof. But let me just press you. I'm not here to put, put Adair Turner's position, but why is his analysis off? As because you put it? it is absolutely not true. And I'm, you know, I mean, you read Bill Gates, I mean, it's not me, I'm a, who am I? But you read Bill Gates' book and he says, you know, storage 
it's going to maybe have a times three improvement. If we don't have storage, we don't have renewable energy. Look at the price of electricity going through the roof in Europe because the price of gas is going through the roof. And you know, it has no relationship with the installation of renewables. None. Zero. We have done nothing. In California, in California, they have all the sun in the world. They are building gas plants. In, in China, they're still building coal plants. You can say we're going to divest. The Australians don't want you to divest. They said they're going to sell gas all right. and, 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 and coal. So I think we have to come back to basics. And all this is so abstract. It's kind of uh, amazing that we're still talking about this to me. To me. Franklin, do, do you mind? I disagree. Okay. <laughs> do you, I, I want Did to you be, think Adair Turner was off? No, no, no. I want to be off with Adair Turner, even though my English is not as good. But um, I, I think we have not to mix two things, which is the long-term trend. And again, not a transition. I don't like this word, but the transitory. You can have a graph where you're there, you land there, and the graph in between does all sorts of crazy things. One of the things you described, which is the price market, and I referred to the, the electricity, the spot market, which I refer to, is linked to a bad combination. I don't want to be te too technical. It's linked to a bad te a combination of regulation, the good old style Reaganomics, which we took time to implement, with uh, energies of the future still being mixed with 2% of energies of the past. Okay, so. We have transitory problems, that's for sure. Now about intensity of, uh, uh, of uh, density, sorry, you're right, of, of energies, we could have technical discussions on the capex, but as we have slabs of investment in your renewable energies, which have been done already and where we don't put uh, the energy into the system so far, when we turn that into hydrogen, that's still profitable. The OPEX that you have makes your CAPEX uh, distributed over a larger bandwidth of, of, of energy. And that kind finance the, the, the transition towards business models where the cost of hydrolyzers will be uh, lower, which needs 20 to 25 years. So I think I would agree with Adair Turner that we have a problem of time. Uh, we don't know if we have time for this technology. And regulation, where I would agree with you, is that regulators add to the mess. Politicians, well, sorry for the politicians in the room, add to the mess and the slowness. And investors are legitimately, legitimately uh, uh, confused, you know. To me, um, you know, I think what's important, and, and let me now, I, I have in front of me the statement from the Secretary General. Um, this latest national determined contributions put us on a path, he says, on a catastrophic pathway of 2.7 degrees of heating. Um, that the science tells us that we need a 45% cut in emissions by 2030. Uh, but we are right now on a trajectory of an increase of 16% compared to 2010 levels. So I think um, whatever we want to, I mean, the, the signals are very clear. The science is very clear of what needs to be done. Now it requires, as I said, in my view, it requires Could I just say, the political I just heard, leaders. I just heard from Franklin question how to do it. He didn't have a microphone there, but he did say how to do it. So pick it up, Mafalda, can you? Basically, the, 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 the politicians, uh, they, they have started. They are, they are providing the signals and putting in place the policies. They need to be more ambitious in many places. They need to put targets. They need to provide signals to the markets. They need to put the regulations in place to incentivize uh, the private sector. The fossil fuel uh, returns that people are talking about um, are on the back of decades of subsidies. Um, and even still today, we have uh, significant fossil fuel subsidies prevalent in the market, and therefore the calls from many to really end fossil fuel uh, subsidies. Um, if, if it would be interesting to see, you know, if equivalent level of subsidies were being provided as historically have been to fossil fuels, um, whether, you know, in fact, you know, the, the economics of renewable energy would look even different than what we are seeing right now. Um, 
And I, I, I certainly agree that uh, we need to continue to invest uh, and explore uh, other technologies. But I think, you know, a lot of the arguments that, um, that uh, I'm hearing um, today, and they are quite uh, pessimistic, I, I think, you know, certainly there are investments being made. There needs to be a lot more investments uh, made, uh, um, as I said um, earlier on, in particular in developing countries. And the public and the private, they need to come together um, and, 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 and really do what they have been able to do at a certain scale in the past and do it at a much larger scale. But, you know, hiding behind that, you know, some of the arguments that I'm hearing, there will be no returns. If we don't shift course, there will be no returns with the trajectory we are we are moving towards. So these companies, they have to have, you know, the private sector, the, the, uh, you know, we need to collectively think what is the trajectory we are getting into? What is going to happen to returns to, to you know, with, with all of the shocks and the impacts that we are seeing that are just going to intensify? Um, so I think we need to put a solutions hat and not a problems hat. I think uh, I was fascinated by both Mafalda's comments about the fact that these updated NDCs have got us only 15% of the way that we needed to be to be back on the one and a half degree pathway. So they're not going to do it. And I've got a lot of sympathy for Franklin's comments too uh, in saying that, you know, really we are nowhere that we need to be. Uh, but in response to his how do we do it comment, uh, Mark Jacobson, at Stanford uh, showed us how to do it back in 2013. He wrote the game plan for how to get the US onto renewables, showed it was perfectly possible. The required amount of capital had to be invested in the right places, the uh, upgrades to the transmission hubs, etc. Showed the whole thing, then has spent the last eight years rolling that around the world to other countries, other cities. His work subsequently reviewed and critiqued by his rivals at Berkeley. Um, there's about six or seven other studies, all that support the view that, yes, we can do it with existing technologies. The intermittency problem that Franklin mentioned, uh, we have the battery technology today, and it's only going to develop faster to allow us to deal with that. And yes, there will be a place, I think, for nuclear in some form in some countries, and also natural gas as well. But let's hope it's limited to allow us to meet the very important target of one and a half degrees. But let me be clear, do you agree um, with Joel that there are there is not a mega trend, as he put it at the moment? Uh, I, Nick, I'm not even sure I understood that absence of mega trend. I, I see one giant mega trend, uh, which is our, our battle with uh, the climate crisis and ecosystem and biodiversity loss. Uh, they're one and the same. It, it's a huge mega trend. Um, it, it's underway. I think m maybe... To Franklin's point, one of the reasons that we aren't yet where we need to be is that the date associated with all of this is 2050. It feels very distant. It feels non-personal. But I bet you if you ask the people in uh, Northwest US or the folks in Germany uh, recently uh, who had their homes and lives disrupted by flooding, I think the more we see these kinds of natural disasters, or rather unnatural disasters, the more personal it gets, the more you'll start to see the kind of change that we need that will drive this. Are you saying if there was a much more brutal deadline, say of 2025, 2028, as opposed to 2050, that would focus minds a bit like COVID has focused all our minds in the last 18 months quickly? Yeah, COVID has felt very personal and we've dealt with it. All right, Martin, you want to pick up? But number of comments, really. I mean, wh where I agree with Franklin is it's very important to to start with the facts and reality of where we are and, and, and the outlook is... Do you agree with him? Um, I agree with some of what he says, yeah, um, which is that um, uh, where we are now, it's, it's, it's fine for Adair to talk about technology and their solutions. And I think these are important because some years ago we weren't sure that there were solutions. But the reality is we're in a, we are in a difficult space. We're in a difficult position at the moment. And there are mega trends in my view. I think the climate change is one of them. But the other mega trend is that demand for energy around the world continues to grow. And the reason that demand for energy around the world continues to grow is because, I'm sorry, there are a lot of poor people all around the world and they don't want to die in the meantime, right? And the provision of energy to those people 
allows them to have better living standards. So, so these are two very important and contradictory megatrends which are out there at the, at the moment, and we haven't really understood how to make them compatible. And I think it's just important that we acknowledge that because that leads to important next steps, which is that we probably need to face that, you know, there may be flooding in Germany. I'm not saying it's a good thing, it's a bad thing, but there are lots of people dying in Africa now because they don't have energy provided to them. And those two things are conflicting. And we have to be honest about that. And we have to think about how we're going to solve those two trends simultaneously. And that's a very, very big task. Well, as I mentioned earlier, in an earlier session, even, even the scientists are saying they've never seen jet streams and gulf streams hover in the way they've been hovering, which has led to the temperature increases, the weather, in ways which all of you know. In other words, this is all new stuff. So I respectfully disagree with, with Franklin and agree with Adair. Uh, the only thing uh, that disappointed me in Adair's brilliant presentation was that he didn't mention nuclear energy. And I think that uh, um, Franklin probably is a little bit too focused on the big mistake that Germany made by getting out of nuclear energy instead of getting out of coal. This is a big mistake. I think we all agree on that today. But I think there is we need both. We need renewable energy, wind and sun, and we need nuclear energy at the same time. We cannot do without them. And, th and saying that um, uh, wind and, and, uh, and sun are not the solution because they are too expensive is not true. They are now bec become cheap. Uh, and uh, it's true that uh, hydrogen from green electricity is expensive today, but we can expect the same trend in decreasing costs. Um, therefore, you know, I think we need both. We should not uh, demonize one against the other. We need both, really. What we need to get out of is coal. Thomas from, uh, from Highgate. This afternoon has been fascinating because we heard three... Oh, I did that. Three completely different things. Adair told us about what we can do. Then Mafalda told us about what we must do. And these guys here... Uh, uh, Martin, Joel, and Franklin told us about what we are doing. And obviously, these are three fundamental different things. Uh, and I think it's very important to also hear the very uh, cold-blooded view of what is currently happening, independently from what we could do and what we must do. Uh, um, and uh, to avoid the wishful thinking is extremely important. Because now, the real question that I have to the panel is, how do we pass from what we are doing now and to what we could do, to what we must do, because otherwise we're in bad shape. So it's not could, it's what need to do, judging by what the Secretary General has talked about. Could which we or must do? 2.7 degrees is where we're heading, what, not 1.5 degrees. What we must do, but it's not happening now. So how do we create a mega trend that is not happening on the investment front, on the, cons on the energy consumption front, even if we wish for it's not happening. So how can we create a real movement, a real mega trend to right. we'll change the dynamic? Yeah, hi, Rafael Rodkin from E2MC Ventures, and I'm a venture capitalist investing in space companies. So by definition, I'm a complete techno optimist. So just as a caveat, but do you ever do pessimism? Sorry, do you ever do pessimism? I actually don't have pessimism. Okay. I'm a complete optimist. But so part of my optimism is so when I look at uh, how people are allocating, people actually have skin in the game, right? Who have money in their own funds. I see, for example, hundreds of millions of dollars going into nuclear fusion companies. I see hundreds of millions of dollars going, for example, into companies that, are, that, that want to grow meat from stem cells. Really a lot of money. So what I hear sort of an implicit message from this panel that there is some sort of uh, flaw in the capital allocation. Is, is that actually what I'm hearing or am I wrong on that? And maybe Franklin can comment whether he is able to raise money for his uh, nuclear project. Reiterate uh, Thomas' point and, and defend Franklin because... Um, it's one, say to th one thing to say all of these things are possible, but in real politik, which I think is what Franklin's saying, is it's just not happening. So it's, it's fine that it's possible, but it doesn't solve our problem. So I still haven't heard an answer to his challenge, really, which is what is going to change actual behavior, whether it's from investors, government, or consumers, because the fact that it's possible doesn't mean that it happens. And then I will just leave you guys with one point, which I loved from a NASA scientist who says... Um, that we shouldn't turn to hope and optimism to solve the climate crisis because it's too late and we're basically screwed no matter what. 
And she says, we need courage, not hope. And courage is the resolve to do well without the assurance of a happy ending, which I find <laughs> extremely interesting and provocative. Thank you. The energy transition is not about business. It's about civilization. You were talking about civilization, not how much money we're going to make. Fossil fuel defined our civilization. I don't see solar and wind defining our civilization. And I would disagree with you that it's so easy to say it's cheap. It takes a huge amount of space. Huge amount of space. It's huge amount of space. The offshore wind is enormous. It's super complicated. It's 100 miles from the coast. Incredibly complex and very energy, uh, energy hungry because they're all the cement and the steel. It's very complex. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it, but I think we should be realistic that this is a low energy density technology that is not going to take us to the next civilization step. And about optimism or pessimism, this is not the problem. The problem is you have somebody shooting at you. You're in the trenches. Am I going to be optimistic? Am I going to get out of this? No, I just need to know how to shoot at the guy. You know? <laughs> so how am I going to shoot at the guy? How am I going to kill him? It's like, yeah, we need to kill him. Of course we need to kill him. But how am I going to kill him is the issue. I'm, I'm an optimist. No one noticed. I'm sorry. But once, thanks to Thomas for the question, uh, and going to what Mafalda said, once we have the diagnosis, it's left to us to choose. And I'm an optimist because we have no option but to develop uh, those classes of assets. Forget about the mega trends. If you agree with the fact that we don't have classes of assets defined as a good time frame and a pretty reasonable idea of the risks and rewards, then the capitalist system being the capitalist system, you have the commercial banks, you have the investment banks, and you have the central banks, which have a sheer interest in developing these classes of assets. It can be through reallocation of uh, existing assets. When you talk to a banker, they tell you, okay, what divers coal? Cool. Well, will divers gas? Huh. Uh, what will we invest in? You know? So they, they, they feel edgy. So they want, and hence the ESG and everything, we've not mentioned much, but that's part of the reason why uh, uh, the, the business itself, the financial business, the, 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 the financial system that refunds your investment funds, have an interest in a, a climate finance to develop. Very quickly, quickly in terms of, of central banks, we've been able to create money for all sorts of reasons over the last 10 years. Can't we have money creation, currency creation, money creation for, uh, uh, for, uh, for the environment, uh, to have money that doesn't go into the financial system but to into green investment funds. I would call it not special drawing rights, but special development rights. By the way, the Chinese love the ID, but no one loves the Chinese these days, so maybe the ID has to be popularized more. Let me just pick up on that point from Joel, though, uh, that we have no option now but to develop these classes of assets. Is that the way the market feels? Um, I think so, yes. Um, but um, I, think, um, I think there's a high degree of consensus around that. I think the, the challenge is that people aren't sure how to do it, right? And, and that's, I think, one of the, uh, the, the themes that we've had. It, it seems to me that what's, what's absolutely critical to be positive, how can we move forward? We need to price carbon. Um, we need to have a global carbon price to allow for proper capital allocation, proper pricing, proper demand uh, um, suppression for demand suppression for high carbon, um, uh, high carbon assets. Right? Um, you know, th at one level, this is a really simple problem in economic terms. Any of us who've done, you know, first stage economics, you learn about externalities, right? And carbon's an externality which wasn't priced for many years, and we figured out that there's a really high price, and we're trying now to price it into our global economic system. That's really what this problem is. That's pretty straightforward conceptually. The problem is that the energy system and the carbon system around the world is really, really complex, right, in terms of, in terms of the private sector 
um, politicians' consumer behaviour in the way that we've been talking about it. So generally speaking, in, the, in, in pretty much any economic system which has been reasonably successful around the world for any period of time, you need to find a way to price the outcomes that you want. So pricing ca carbon would be a, around the world in a consistent basis would be a massive step forward. That it would require policy makers to really bite the bullet. If you look what's happened in the EU, right, we've had a carbon trading system in the EU, what, since 2005, I want to say, 2004. It was around, most of that time, carbon's been around 5 to 10 euros a tonne. It's now 60 euros a tonne. And is that leading to changes of behavior and changes in investment? Yes. So we, we've got to bear that in mind because, as I've mentioned before, at the moment, the behavior patterns are really perverse. I'll give you a micro trend. We've talked about macro trend. I guarantee that among this audience, there's been a micro trend, which is that there are more electrical vehicles um, owned by this audience than relative to two or three years ago. I and mean, we could do a show of okay, hands. Okay, let's do a show of but, hands. But who's got an, it, who's right? got an EV? And, and who didn't say three years ago? And who, right? didn't, who had one three years ago? Almost the same people. Yeah, but 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 is it but the same more, EV as more, you had three years ago? More hands than now than, than three years ago. So and, and indeed there are more electric vehicles around the world, but there are about 10, 11 million electric vehicles around the world out of a fleet of 1.2 billion around the world. That's the size of the problem. And I hate to be you know pessimistic because I was going to make these points the other way around and and give the carbon pricing as an optimistic piece to begin with. But the really depressing thing is about the growth of electric vehicles is that the savings that we have had um, by going to electric vehicles relative to gasoline vehicles are more than offset in the same period of time by the growth in SUVs around the world. Right? So, so that's telling us something really important coming back to you know, Adair's point and the other things, which is, you know what? The behavior patterns are not going to get us there. It needs to be something much more radical, much more dramatic, which is a mixture of really tough public policy and uh, um, pricing, market mechanisms, and technological innovation. All right, it's going that's, to be a mixture of those things. All right, that's, that's a view from SMB. Sorry, can uh, I, can uh, I go margin, to marginal edit. What you said on the, on the price, on, on the carbon price uh, in Europe is very important. And this happened without... Uh, policy uh, regulation, but uh, on this market, but based on the policy environment which the market players understood. So, uh, no no market manipulation, pure market. Uh, you and I, can I come to you because we've heard the S and P view uh, on what we heard from Joel about the need. There's no option but to develop this class of assets now. What's your view from Hermes? I'm still a little bit mystified as to what this class of assets is, Nick, but maybe if I can pick up on a few other points. Well, help define uh, it. Help define well, it. Uh, I think if, we, if you want very quickly, the actions that we can take, 50 to $60 a tonne for carbon is not enough. My climate friends tell me it should be more like 150 to 200 uh, We need to end subsidies around the world for fossil fuels. Uh, they are still massively subsidized, even in the UK, and we don't realize it because there's a lower VAT on natural gas, for example, a classic uh, way of getting around the system. We need to make sure that banks keep to their promises, uh, net zero promises to 2050, and that's on us as shareholders to make sure that they do that. How can you be a lending for new coal projects and also keep to a net zero promise? These things are non sequiturs, and we need to call them out as investors. I greatly admire your uh, venture capitalist in the audience, um, and I'm delighted that there are hundreds of millions of dollars going into some of these new technologies. Uh, unfortunately, it's a drop in the ocean for the IEA's estimate of required finance, $4.3 trillion a year by 2050. One quick sort of sobering uh, series of facts, and you mentioned it, I think, Frank, I mean, gas price has gone up by seven times in the last few weeks. It's up to about 175, I think, um, P per therm. You've got gas reserves low. You've got an interconnector which has just gone blown completely between France and, uh, and England. Um, you've, in England, we've run out of uh, wind. Wind has not been producing turbines turning. As a result, 
in the United Kingdom, they've had to start firing up the coal-fired power stations again. Quickly, while I go think about the answer to this, what, how sobering is this new reality that we're facing about, about security of energy in this mix, the expectation of the reliance on, on turbines, on solar? Please, just give your point. Yeah, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to make a, a point about the, the passing remark about the yellow vest movement on five cents increase in gas, because I think we have, we live in the age of distrust, distrust of government, distrust of financial player, and I think we're asking about, you know, we're asking behavioral change. But if you look at carbon price, I mean, of course, the big elephant in the room is gas prices going up and electricity prices going up. But the fact that, you know, carbon price has gone from 20, you know, 20 euros to 60 euros means, doesn't mean that the consumer is not going to be affected. And now you have this perverse mechanism where governments are going to subsidize, you know, basically the price, which is, for me, a waste of capital which should be much more efficiently directed to innovation and science, which is actually going to be the only way out here. All right. How sobering have these new developments been? Quickly, if you can, literally 15 seconds each. Martin. Um, Short-term energy, energy demand has always and does always trump um, long-term needs of the energy transition. Um, that's just, you know, that's, that's not a value judgment on my part. That's just an observation and a fact. Right? that governments um, and uh, consumers want to get energy demand met now. And if that means that they have to resort to fossil fuels or coal in Germany, as we were talking about, that's what happens. Right? And no, no government um, is willing to say um, that you will have to pay substantially more for your energy or have outages um, if they don't have to because the system fails. Right, Joel? Well, I agree. Short term can be uh, bumpy, can be speculative. Some people earn money out of that. Uh, but I think, uh, as I said, uh, we are in transi uh, transitories we, 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 which are shaky anyway. So getting back to one word, subsidies, I'm agnostic on subsidies, but I don't want in 20 years or 30 years having to explain to my daughter that we did subsidize in many ways the food for cats, and I love cats being imported, and we didn't subsidize the energy transition. I don't want to take this chance. So, okay, last word. I think we're in very serious times. I really believe the most equivalent to me is before World War II. And in France, we had the Ligue Maginot. Everybody was telling us it's going to be fine, you know, we're going to be fine, and it didn't work. It was very fragile. We are in very, very serious times. And I have to say this discussion was not serious enough. It's about civilization, it's not about business. What are we gonna do? I don't have the answer, but at least I acknowledge I don't have the answer. And then you can wait for something. You can open yourself to new things because what we have is not what's gonna work. The op the op we must end optimistically. The optimistic quote is that the rate of technological development and the, the reduction, as Adair was saying, of the marginal cost of production of renewables is breathtakingly moving ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that is a super positive thing. Okay. All right. Well, you'll all take away your own view. But um, I hope what we've done in the last two hours is, is at least generated an awareness of how sharp the arguments are.